koto tena koto tena tato katoa. Ko tiaki toko waka, ko tapa wai ua nuku toko manga, ko waia toa toko awa, ko titai o marakura toko moana, ko takahanga toko marai, ko nati pakiha toko iwi, ko Bill Edwards toko ingoa. Kia ora. Um, my name is Bill Edwards and uh, I work for Heritage New Zealand and I'm based here in Northland. And um, my background is in archaeology and I've got very limited um, experience in navigating, mainly terrestrial. I'm of an age where we used to have maps and compasses and we didn't have GPSs. So because of that, I have an understanding of how to navigate using uh, a certain means. But in doing the research about navigating, I've, I've, I've been fascinated not, not only with the mechanics of navigation, but really the philosophy that underpins it. How do people think? How do they perceive the world? How does it all fit together? So, so in this paper, I explore three different types of navigation that all use the whānau marama, which is, is the celestial sky, the, 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 the beads of the sky, and, um, but the approach is using, we, we all navigate by using the stars, but we use it in different tools to achieve where we are and where we are placed in the world. So what I've tried to do is to try and look at how we actually think and how we actually look at the world. <coughs> so a little while ago, there's been um, pulses of people uh, coming out of Africa. That's the current theory anyway. And there's evidence that people um, crossed over in, in numerous pulses and uh, they crossed uh, up in this area here. That's oh, not working. There we go. One group went up this way. One group probably crossed over this way, intermingled here. But one group went south one group went north. And on the way uh, north, um, the group that went north uh, picked up uh, some DNA along there and the people that went south picked up some other DNA on the way down that way. But the point is, is that people walked the whenua, they travelled around and um, they sort of came down uh, by, by the evidence that we have at the moment through China uh, and then came through Southeast Asia. And again, this pulses because we know that Australia was settled uh, maybe 50,000 years ago. Uh, Papua New Guinea was settled very early and then other people came through here. So I think that we can't just simplify it that people just walked here and got here. I think we have got to look at this being various phases of people moving about. But um, what happened is that uh, a group of people came to Te Mono Nui Akiwa, the, as we call the Pacific, and instead of seeing this as a, as, a, as a barrier, they saw it as an opportunity and they embraced this opportunity. So when you look at the, uh, the globe of the world there, you can see how big this ocean is. And it's, it, it, it virtually takes up the whole of one side of the earth. So that is um, a remarkable hunk of water. So how do people do this opportunity? They use this. This is the human brain. And the human brain's an amazing organ, uh, but the, the point about a, a human brain is it can take the collective thinking of lots of people and store it, and that's what we're doing now. And it can pass on accumulated knowledge. So the brain is uh, assisting people in navigation what we're doing is we're accumulating all our experiences and gathering them all together. And as we know, we, we have the spread of people throughout the Pacific using uh, a waka that travelled the highways and byways of the ocean. And here we have a, um, a current model, and it's only a model of where people went to as they peopled this vast uh, ocean. What were the navigation skills of these people? 
I mean, how did they navigate this all? What was their brains doing? And so this is what I have gathered. It's basically the use of na narrative to pass on knowledge. And we've had discussions about that before where we, we talk about learning uh, uh, from the wānanga, about sayings of what was happening at certain times of the year. So this knowledge, this narrative, is actually a way of passing on this knowledge. There's also the pattern recognition of, of, of the celestial skies, being able to understand where they fit, and also building that narrative so that you can actually know where to go. And the other thing that came out too, again today, was understanding the natural world and how it interrelates. So a very clear understanding of how that world actually operates, how it interrelates, and how you fit into that world. And there's also the conceptual framework of the navigator being at the centre. So uh, the centre is, is the waka and you're travelling along. And again, we heard it today about the bounce of the waves on the waka and feeling that, understanding that, knowing what's going on. So culture, tradition and science have been embodied into the skills of the southern family, the family that came down across the Pacific. So, then we have a, another group of people coming here, which came from the north. And um, these, these people eventually developed a technology so they could start moving across the world. And so, what were the skills that they did in order to understand the world, their perception of the world? So, they... It was the use of writing to pass on knowledge. Instead of, using a, a, instead of passing it on orally, it was passed on mainly by writing. Like the people from the south, there was also pattern recognition of how people looked at the stars and understood where everything was. But there was less reliance on the natural world. So um, we had the use of tools such as a compass, a sextant, a chronometer, and a nautical almac. Now, the perception of the world is is actually very different. Rather than being uh, part of the world, you're actually moving yourself from the world. And the reason that you do that is effectively, here we have an orange, or a mandarin in this case, I tried an orange, uh, but the juice went everywhere. And here we can see I'm peeling off time. And we, if we start from here, we peel off some time here, which is basically a slice through our orange, and we're able to track ourselves as we go across the globe. And here we can see here, this is the conceptual model of an equator. So this is the way that the world was perceived. It was perceived as a globe, and it was segmented, and it was divided. And by using that segmentation and division, then the conceptual framework was to remove the navigator and then dividing the world into grids, which is longitude and latitude, <coughs> like this orange. And we have culture, tradition, and science embodied into this model of navigation. So, after approximately 70,000 years, give or take, I wasn't there, but they finally meet in Aotearoa. So we've got the southern whanau, they arrived, give or take, four or 500 years, and then we get the northern family coming in about 250 years ago. And to be really honest, we're learning from each other. We're learning, but we've been all the way around here. It's taken a long time when we're here now. So um, as we're based in the Bay of Islands, I just want to show you some of the stuff that I've just been finding as, we've been, as I've been thinking about this. There's a very famous uh, painting, which is of Kotorareka. It's called The Day Before the Battle. And um, when I started looking closely at this, I, oh, it's a bit, a bit hazy, but um, you can see this here. This is an observatory, and this observatory was used for setting ship's chronometers. This was set in 1845, because if you have a point here, and you move across the globe here, you need to know how much time that is. So once you do that, you know how far you've gone. So in Kororareka in 1845, as all the whaling fleets were coming in, they needed to set their ship's chronometers so that they were, they were, precisely, they were precise against Greenwich Mean Time. And so 
here we have a picture of this observatory here. Now I'm going to talk about the third wave. And uh, again, we, we're using this marvelous organ. Uh, and the person I'm going to talk about is here. Uh, Dr. Uh, I know her as Dr. Elizabeth Alexander. And um, she has a link to Northland. And uh, she also has a link to the way that we view the world today. And what happened is that she was born in India in uh, about 1908. And uh, she went off to Britain and got a doctorate in uh, mathematics, physics, and geology at Oxford University. Anyway, um, in, in about 1937, she married a New Zealander and they went up, uh, or, or from here anyway, they went up to uh, Singapore. And in 1939 and uh, 1940, the uh, Japanese started coming down in 1942. And so um, she left with the children. He, was, he, he got left behind and disappeared. And she came down to New Zealand and her role was actually to set up all the um, uh, uh, radio, radio radar stations in Northland because they thought the Japanese would be coming down from the north and so they needed these radar stations in order to catch these planes as they're coming down. So here we can see this is one of the radar stations. This is up at Fongadora. So um, during World War II, there were, there were five radar stations uh, in northern New Zealand to monitor incoming aircraft. And towards the end of the war, they discovered something called the Norfolk Island effect. And the Norfolk Island effect was that there was sunspot activities and they could record it and see it on their radars. So what uh, uh, Dr. Alexander did is she got them to change the cathode ray tubes and also got them to change in, in one of, one of the uh, stations their, uh, their aerials. And because of that, she was able to pick up this radio activity that was coming from the celestial stars. It was coming from the stars, coming from the sun. So what she did, it was she was able to work out how to view the world or view outside of our world in another way. She thought about it and she published uh, this article, unfortunately, in a very obscure publication in New Zealand. It never saw the light of day and um, someone else in, in Britain claimed that they had done it, but uh, she had done it first. And uh, I just want to bring you to, a, to your attention because she is an unsung hero of the way that we view the world today. So what are the navigations of the third wave? So this is, we're exploring outside of our world now. So we're using narrative and writing to pass on knowledge. And when I say narrative, if I say, Houston, we've got a problem, one small step for man, one great step for mankind, we know what we're talking about. We all know that. And then the conceptual framework is that the navigator is at the centre, but in this case, the centre is this, is this place here. And we also use observation of the stars, so we're using, again, identification of stars, but in this time we're using optical instruments in order to understand where we're going to. And we're also using the radio waves that uh, Dr Alexander sort of looked at and pioneered to measure time and distance like we did here on the globe with peeling back the layers. And uh, we're also using gravity to power these spaceships. So we're actually using the effect of planets and we're firing these things at planets using the gravity and spitting them off. So, and all of this is based on what we've learned over thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of of humans using our brains. So what it means is that we can now do this. This is a picture of Voyager 1. This is the first uh, human-made object to move into interstellar space. This is actually escape from our solar system. And it's using all these tools that we've all accumulated over the time that we've been navigating our way around the globe. And just as it was about to head off, they made Voyager 1 turn round and look at 
uh, the earth, this little blue dot, it's the famous blue dot, is the picture of the earth. So that was taken at 6.4 billion kilometres away. What I want to say is we're all in the same Walker Kia ora. 